going to talk a little bit about other diets before I come back to everything else. It's a senior diet. Okay, so there are a few different diets out there, senior diet. So what is different? What constitutes a senior diet? Why is something a senior diet? And people have, you know, that's hugely marketed in the, in the sort of, uh, pretty much every single brand has got some form of senior diet. So what's, what is different? So when we talk about when you're a vet or when you're discussing senior diet, so what is different? It's lower calorie, usually. The idea behind that is that when we get older, we don't need as much. Uh, I certainly am eating much less than what I was in my teens and twenties. And if I eat the same amount, it would be a totally different story. So we understand that when we get older, lower calorie. So feeding your 11 year old dog that is doing much less runs, the same food when you're serving when it's three years old, the same amount, um, you know, the, the, ide the ideology behind it is like, okay, it's maybe quite logical to say that maybe you need less calorie, but they don't eat less. So they want to feed the same amount, so you go for lower calorie. High digestible protein. So the idea behind that is when we get older, our ability to digest protein is rephrased. When dogs get older, <laughs> their ability to digest protein is not as good as when they're young. So you want to give more simple protein to digest. And that is the changes of protein amount and protein level as well in the food as well. Some senior diets, they actually include joint supplements already. Things like chondroitin and glucosamine is actually included in the diet. Because supposedly again, all the dogs in get arthritis and that is where they need the extra help for uh, supplements. Um, supplements is a whole different ball game of how helpful it is. The gastrointestinal health, it's um, in older animals, needs a little bit more support as well. So that is uh, whereby they add in sort of beetroot pulp and flaxseed so that it helps gastrointestinal digestion, uh, formation of um, um, sort of a more form poop um, that may be quite helpful as well compared to a younger, <coughs> a younger dog having the normal diet, so to speak. Certainly in older dogs, you can talk about senile dementia as well, so cognitive health. So that's something that they also add in, uh, in hope to uh, support what they need for the brain to reduce the risk or delay the risk of senile dementia. They put in vitamin E and L-carnitine, which is all very, very good, strong antioxidants to um, sort of uh, recycle the free <coughs> radicals that run in the brain. Skin and, coat, uh, skin and coat health, <coughs> arguably, you know, um, we all need it at whatever age there is, but in older animals, it well could be that they need extra care, so that is also uh, not uncommon uh, um, ingredients that they add in as well. Immune system. So this one is similar to what we talk about in humans. Uh, when we get older, uh, the immune system usually may not be as robust. So usually, in immunology, immune system, the so-called the more acceptable, susceptible group is the very, very young and the very, very old. Because the very, very young, they're not exposed enough to get a good immune system yet. And the very, very old is that whatever the immune system they have, they, it may be so slowly compromised as they get older because um, they're just getting older. Immune system isn't as good. So they add in things like omega-3, omega-6, just to boost up the immune system. EFA stands for essential fatty acids, which is also quite a big thing. Even the hotter environments, they're always talking about omega-3s. So that's a uh, more for senior diet. Low protein <coughs> diet. So why in some, you know, some people they talk about giving low protein diet. My dog is too active. I'm going to give you a low protein diet. I'm not going to give you a working dog diet, okay, because it's not working dog. And there are sort of different diets like this. Working dog, low protein. So what's different in a low protein diet? So minimum protein level is 18%. That is needed for all dog food. That is what has been determined. And um, so usually protein level is higher than that. And when they have, when they talk about low protein diet, the minimum is usually 18%. Okay, so question about for behavioral issues. As in, my dog is too active, you give it a little bit, uh, it, it's more active on high protein diet compared to low protein diet, so you give low protein diet, it's not as going to be as jumpy because it is not a working dog, it doesn't exert out. It's almost like the analogy behind that would be similar to a sugar rush you give the kids. It's a, uh, and, uh, and where they just go crazy at parties because all they have is sugar, so to speak. Uh, so similar for a dog, so if they're supposed to be very, very, very active and you are giving a high protein working dog, diet when a dog is just a pet that goes for little walks, then giving a low protein diet may help. Um, weight loss, same again for protein directly linked to sort of the calorie intake. So if you reduce the amount of protein, you reduce the amount of calories, and certainly you can achieve weight loss in overweight dogs. 
and this is not used, this wouldn't be recommended to be used for growth phases and reproduction. So growth phases is when the dog is growing. You don't give it a low protein diet because the dog needs the extra protein to build the muscles, to get the strength, to get in, to increase in size. For reproduction as well, I mean, the, the bitch will be producing, you know, uh, building bones, <laughs> building extra muscles, building milk. So you wouldn't be giving that. So there's a contraindication of the low protein diet. But um, yeah, so that low protein diet is pretty big out there in the market as well. So advantages is uh, better gastrointestinal health. So the idea behind it is lower protein, less putrefaction. So in the guts, it's been shown to say that um, if you have less protein, there is less protein to break down. Uh, I wouldn't use the word rotting, okay, but it's along those soft lines, so there's less putrefaction. So the gut um, organisms, the bacteria, the microorganisms, tend to do much better on lower protein, so they get better GI health. And this has been linked to a longer lifespan as well, whereby there was a paper out there that suggests that dogs that live longer, they found that they were on a lower protein diet. So I put a question up there, but it's been linked to lower life, uh, to sort of a longer lifespan as well, because of all the other issues that usually come along. So I don't think it's just a diet itself, but it's the association with that. Mm -hmm. So if you have less perfection in the gastrointestinal, then you have less GI issues that may link to longer health, uh, longer lifespan. So this advantage is that, interestingly, it is also linked to the increased risk of uh, coprophagia, which means uh, poop eating. Okay, <laughs> and the whole idea behind it is that maybe there isn't enough protein in their diet. They need to eat something else to regenerate or to 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 replenish or to supplement the lack of protein. And they found that uh, they can uh, eat, eat their poop. Okay. Limiting amino acids. So amino acids is the very very basic building block of protein. If you are limiting the protein, there wouldn't be that there will be a risk potentially, which is why there's a minimum protein level of 18% of the body actually not being able to build more muscles because you're limiting the amount of protein that is actually having. So you're actually limiting the amount of building blocks as given. Example. Let's use blocks. Lego. Okay. If you want to build a big castle, I only give you five pieces every day. There's only so much you can do, so to speak, compared to I give you more and you can build more things. Yeah, so it's literally building blocks. You're limiting the amino acids. Yeah. I thought this was quite funny. Mm -hmm. Every snack you make, every meal you bake, every bite you take, I'll be watching you. <laughs> Okay, hypoallergenic diet. So we have also heard of this uh, particular diet whereby, um, just to break it down, hypo means less of. Allergenic is usually something that's allergic okay, diet. So these are usually diets that's for dogs with um, diarrhea or potentially with skin issues. And we're thinking, okay, is this something the diet that your, your, this little dog is allergic to? So can we present a diet whereby it doesn't give so much allergens, so much irritations? To the body so that it doesn't manifest in um, itchy skin or having diarrhea. So hypoallergenic diet. So what, what is different in that? What do they mean by that? Usually for dogs with skin or GI sensitivity, as you mentioned, novel protein. So the idea of a no, novel protein, novel means new, okay? Uh, we know they all need a source of protein, okay? So the idea of novel protein is like, example, if your dog is on chicken and rice, then and it is a uh, having sensitivity issue, then we may consider things like maybe duck and sweet potato, changing the source of protein and the carbohydrates. Okay, so that's where a lot of hypoallergenic diet comes. Just introducing a completely new protein that wouldn't be the same as the original protein that was causing the uh, allergen the irritation. Okay, and just to break it down a little bit more. Usually, what it discuss is a protein as a molecule, and on the molecule itself. There are little, um, there are, there are little radar coming out, and those bits are the one that causes um, the irritation. Okay, which brings me to my next point of hydrolyzed protein. Hydrolyzed protein is whereby they actually break that protein up into much smaller pieces, so that the little bit that causes irritation is no longer present. Okay, so example, if a little doggy was allergic to chicken, but now we're giving a hydrolyzed chicken. You're breaking the molecule down such that it doesn't even look like chicken anymore. Okay, but it is still chicken. It's just molecule being broken down so that you can still give it. So there's a hydrolyzed protein. 
So you're breaking the uh, molecule to a smaller version such that the bits that causes the irritation is no longer present. So that's why that's a lot of hypoallergenic diet. It falls into either using a completely novel protein or a hydrolyzed protein. And it's still chicken, but it's no longer chicken the way they see it. So the dog doesn't recognize it and hence it doesn't cause that reaction. Low carb grain free diet. Okay, so you've also heard of grain free diet and low carb diets. Um, usually, grain, just to be clear, it's part of carbohydrates. So, low carb grain free. So, grain free is the extreme of a low carb diet. So, carbohydrates, as we know, it's things like grains, rice, and things like that that we need to uh, as part of our body. So, the argument behind that is that dogs are not very good at breaking down carbohydrates because in the wild they eat meat you don't see a wolf eating grass and, uh, or, or breaking down any form of carbohydrates it's all from meat so to speak so what is different is that there's a minimum to no grain as a source of carbohydrates starch digestibility is the bit that always goes into talk about okay can dogs actually digest starch is there any point giving a dog carbohydrates Okay, and uh, studies have shown that they actually do have quite a bit of ability to digest starch. So to say that they don't is not necessarily true. So that if you're using that as a theory to give grain free, it's not uh, that accurate really. So there, there, there isn't much of standing ground because they can actually digest starch. Mycotoxin has been linked to grain, 2011, uh, to 2019. So a fairly recent paper. Okay, to say that to give a grain. That's the whole idea of giving grain free because they have linked mycotoxin with grain in dog food. Okay, so one advantage of giving grain free is that you reduce the amount of mycotoxin that is found in dog food, okay? um, which is a good thing um, if that is the only reason for giving grain free. Having said that, in the same year, last year, there was a quite a big study, it was quite interesting already, it came out. Grain free diet has been linked to heart disease. Okay, so giving a grain-free diet, the animal is more likely to get heart disease. So, go figure. <laughs> tricky, tricky. But these are sort of different, different papers that's being said out there. Vegetarian or vegan diet, it's out there. It is out there. Okay, and you know, usually linked with owner's belief. I'm a vegetarian. I think my dog should be vegetarian too. Okay, it's entirely possible, it is possible, it's not impossible, it's entirely possible in terms of nutritional requirements due to the omnivore status. Okay, so just like us, they can go vegan because they are not an obligate carnivore compared to cats. Cats, they have to have meat. Okay, but dogs, they are actually are omnivores. So theoretically, it's entirely possible in terms of nutritional requirements. Okay. Special considerations does include protein, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin 12, taurine, L-carnitine, omega-3, particularly DHA and, e uh, and EPA because these are usually found more in sort of uh, meat that is easily available. If you want to have a challenge of going down completely vegetarian or even vegan, these are the nutrients that is usually lack of. And that is where you get a bit more creative to supply those sort of things. Okay? Potential risk does include alkaline urine, okay, and the reason why alkaline urine is mentioned because uh, they are potentially potentially more prone to infection and crystals compared to acidic urine. Okay, so a potential risk includes alkaline urine, and for obvious reasons, nutrient inadequacy. If you don't balance it enough, then with the best intention, they may be lacking something, especially the special considerations that was mentioned over there, and that is not very very good. Yeah, but it is out there, it is entirely possible. I'm not advocating it, but I'm just saying that if you hear something like that, okay, it's not entirely animal cruelty to a certain extent. Yeah. In terms of nutritional status, I'm not sure about the whole boringness, but yeah, nutritional status, just be clear. When you're a vegan and find a speck of gluten in your kale and quinoa cell or whatever, <laughs> your eyes go big. 